Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me again on my uh, second trip to the Zoomatica um, webinars. I um, hope I didn't screw up too badly last time because obviously they invited me back. So yay. So I'm uh, going to talk tonight about feline rehabilitation. Um, I think, you know, from the rehab perspective, we do talk an awful lot about, you know, what happens with our canines and how we get them back on the road and our working canines and everything else. And I think, you know, it's easy to forget the kitties and, you know, they need um, rehabilitation. They have just as much surgery as our um, canine friends do. So, you know, sometimes, you know, feline re rehabilitation is a bit like a baby unicorn, you know, or a baby pig you don't see many um, but when you do they really are quite memorable so we're going to have a little chat about um, just some indications that what might what that might bring a cat into the rehab clinic, um, how we handle cats specifically, because obviously they're not dogs. Um, and then I've got some tips and tricks on some of the exercises that we use um, to help our feline friends stay fabulous and flexible. And I have a really cool case study on a cat that um, came into the clinic. Um, so I, I hope that it'll be um, enjoyable for you and give you a few tips and tricks and some ideas um, to help some of your feline friends as well. So we all know cats are an enigma and I have a really, I have an excellent tea mug that one of my clients bought for me and it has a little crown on it and it says dogs have owners, cats have staff. And I, I think it's true, you know, back in Egyptian times, cats were worshipped as gods and they've never forgotten it. I think it's handed down in their DNA that they need to be, you know, on high and praised from above. So I know my two certainly are, bless them. So obviously, you know, we see a lot and we think this is how we see cats doing rehab. You know, we can get them to do these fancy stretches. We can get them doing all these exercises. And, you know, this is basically what cats think of rehab. They're like, you're not telling me to do anything. And it's all a big joke. So we'll, um, we'll crack on and have a look at some of, um, some of our cases and what we've been up to so this this is actually my old cat this is Sarge bless him um I got into a bit of a Pilates kick and got a like a stowable reformer and he thought it was great he's like I'm just gonna sit here and um, I'm gonna show you that um you know I can stretch my toe beans you know and um you're not going to exercise so we we nicknamed this the Pilates station um because he, he, anytime it came out, he insisted on sitting on it and cleaning his feet. So I have no idea. So just taking a look at this cute little face here. I mean, what do we think this cat is thinking? I mean, I know what she was thinking because this was actually my cat. This was Nina, love of my life. And um, I know exactly what she was thinking. But looking at her face, if you'd not met her before, what do you think that she would be thinking? I know she was thinking about food because food was her life. Um, but, you know, how do we know that she's not in pain? You know, she's maybe telling me that the house is on fire and we need to get out. You know, so, you know, just sometimes just looking at them, you know, isn't really enough to know exactly what they're thinking. What about this one? Just to have a look at that. I mean, I will say this is not one of my patients. This is a picture I pulled off the Internet. But, you know, just by looking at that kitten, you know, is that, kitten painful? Is it crying because it's hurt itself? Um, did somebody steal his chicken nuggets? Um, is he, What is up with him? Or, you know, is he just singing to a really good jam of Bon Jovi? You know, again, really, really hard to assess just by looking at a picture. So a little trickier. Um, what about this one? What do we think this one is thinking? I mean, you know, from outward appearance, looks fairly comfortable sitting on a little you know padded bed I mean it's it's really 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 tricky to kind of assess how a cat is feeling you know a lot of my owners you know they see a lame dog and they know they're lame and they bring them into the clinic you know cats will always wait until you blink or look away and then they move so that you you can't see that they're injured or you can't see that they're painful you know so they may sit in one spot in a comfy position um so you know sometimes it's a little difficult to try and assess that so cats are really a little hard to read 
um, as opposed to most of our canine patients. They're very good at hiding everything. And a lot of the time, pain and discomfort can be misinterpreted as just being, you know, a cat being quiet. You know, we see it all the time. And I'm sure, you know, any of you in GP practice, you know, people with older cats are quick to assume that inactivity is just explained as, oh, the cat's getting old, where in fact, you know, it can be inflammation, pain and arthritis. You know, cats actually suffer more from arthritic joint changes than dogs do. Um, and sometimes at much earlier age, you know, we see cats are a lot more flexible. You know, they're a lot more um, slinky like. So they put their spines into a lot more flexion, extension and side bending. So we see a lot of vert intervertebral um, like disc hardening and a lot of like spontaneous like back arthritis with these cats, their hips and their knees tend to bother them a lot more. So, you know, instead of moving around and being agile, they tend to kind of just sit and sometimes people can misinterpret that. So how about some tips and tricks for kind of, you know, decoding kitten secrets? So what do we talk about? We changes in behavior. So, you know, I've got cats, they scoot about the house. You know, if one of them stopped scooting about the house, I'd be like, hey, what's up? So, you know, is an active cat being particularly quiet? Is there, you know, a change or an avoidance for something? You know, both of mine will, you know, come and seek me out and be like, pet me, pet me, pet me, usually when I'm sitting doing a webinar. Um, so, you know, a cat seeking owners out, you know, for reassurance or are you finding the cat going to pet the cat and the pet cat kind of like slinks away? Um, grooming patterns, you know, dental paint is a big issue with cats. So, you know, if they can't groom themselves, then their coat suffers. So they do they have like that dull, lackluster coat that's kind of dry and they call it a bit starey. So it kind of like tufts and looks a little kind of, you know, greasy and a bit matted. I mean, that could be an indication of either oral pain or back pain. You know, it takes an awful lot for the cats to kind of, you know, pick up their legs and play the cello when they clean their bottoms. You know, so if they've got decreased spinal flexibility, then we're going to see, you know, a decrease in these grooming patterns. So keeping an eye on that is super important. You know, countersurfers, you know, I have one that countersurfs and I have one that doesn't. Um, you know, so I know if, if you know, if Rock wasn't able to get up on the counter, you know, I know there's something wrong. So, you know, has there been a change in normal behaviours? Is there any guarding? You know, we go back to kind of looking at this cat right here. And, you know, how do we know that he or she isn't keeping her, you know, the front legs tucked under because we have elbow arthritis, we have a paw injury um, and such like. So, you know, do we have this guarding like, you know, you can't see it because it's painful. I'm going to take it away so you can't see it. Do you go towards that cat and see kind of standoffish behavior, you know, maybe some low growling or a change in kind of, you know, tail flicking, ears go back or they may just kind of get up and start to walk away. A big one, postural difficulties in the litter box. I mean, not that anybody wants to talk about pooping on a Wednesday evening during a webinar, but you know, if you think about the biomechanics of peeing and pooping as far as cats and dogs goes, you know, pooping requires a lot of balance and kind of hip and stifle flexion and then core control. So if there's decreased flexibility in the spine or discomfort in the spine, you know, we could get inappropriate elimination outside the litter box. And it's very easy to kind of put that down to a behavioral issue where it could be pain and arthritis. And also, you know, it's, even if it is an old geriatric, you know, is that litter box too high? You know, do we have to change the dimensions of the litter box so that kitty can actually get into it with a little bit more comfort and ease? So, you know, sometimes these possibly, um, these inappropriate eliminations outside the litter box are not necessarily all behavioral related. So, you know, we always encourage our owners. You know, it's one of the questions we ask when we take a full history. You know, are they having any difficulty, you know, getting in and out of the litter box? 
um, any limping, which sometimes is a little trickier to see than others, any difficulty climbing, you know, cat trees up on the furniture, up onto your lap. Do they seem like they want to get up there, but they're just not able to? They don't feel like they're capable. Um, stiffness after rest, you know, a body in motion stays in motion. So when it stops, it tends to seize up a little bit. So, you know, if you come home from work and Kitty's curled up in the bed and you call Kitty over, is Kitty having a harder time getting up um, after, you know, prolonged periods of rest? Because that can also indicate pain and stiffness associated with arthritis. Lack of enthusiasm for familiar toys. You know, I mean, one look at my house and you'll see that there are cat toys all over the place. I'm big into making sure that they have a lot of enrichment. You know, we're at work and I want to make sure that they have things to entertain them. So and there are there are firm favorites. So, you know, if if any of my two stop playing with their firm favorites, then, you know, is something going on? Are they feeling 100 percent? So a lot of things, you know, they're trying to tell us what's going on and we just have to kind of be alert and also give our owners these tips and tricks to say these are some things that you can look for to make sure that your cat is comfortable. And I think the biggest one I remember when I was training to be a veterinary nurse back in the UK, you know, somebody told me that, you know, a, a cat that's painful doesn't purr. And I'm like, it is. It's a defense mechanism. And, you know, it's it, they're basically telling you it's okay if I purr, you know, my bees are running and you think I'm okay and I'm not, but I really don't want to tell you. So, you know, a cat in pain will still purr. So we have to use a lot of these other things to kind of detect any discomfort. So there are some seriously smart people that have come out with something called the feline grimace scale. Um, I'm going to click on this wee link here and with any luck, it's going to whiz me over to a website. Woohoo! So this, um, this is a great kind of new system. Um, as you can see, there's an app for that now, um, but it really does um, assess acute pain based on facial expression. And this thing is absolutely amazing. So you can download it. You can have your owners download it. It's a way to look at um, facial features. So you'll see down here, ear, eye and whisker position. So obviously this picture down here, this cat is um, doing OK, seems happy. Whiskers are nice and relaxed. Eyes are open. Ears are happy. And then we start to kind of get to see some changes. We've got some changes in whisker position. The whiskers tend to be kind of more pinched. Um, eyes are slightly closed. Ear position is a little different. And this is where we start to think, OK, this 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 cat is it starting to look like it's in pain. And then obviously this poor chap over here or chapess um, is very much in discomfort. You'll see flaring of the whiskers, low head carriage, um, flattening of the ears and a squinting of the eyes. So, you know, you've got three really nice, easy pictures there. Um, there's a lot more on this left, right hand side. You'll see this is a full detail of the Grimace scale. So I really, really encourage you um, to come over to felinegrimmascale.com and take a look because it's a really nifty way to kind of really start to try and assess some of the pain um, associated in cats just by looking at eye, whisker and mouth parameters. Um, so it's a it's a really cool idea, really cool idea. So obviously, you know, cats, if they're faced with something stressful, um, they typically try and alleviate that stress that they feel by distancing, 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 distancing themselves from the stressor. So, you know, run now, ask questions later. Um, you know, if they can't run, they may try and kind of do that time wasting thing where they kind of start to groom themselves and be like, hey, look, you know, I'm over here. I'm doing this. You can just go away and hope that that stressor removes itself. So they will either remove themselves from it or wait until that stressor leaves. Um, and then as a last resort, they'll kind of explode. Um, when it comes to obviously restraining any kind of cat, whether it be for exams or, you know, if we're trying to do rehab, never make a cat do anything that you want it to do. There's lots and lots of different ways to try and make it as amicable as possible. And I think nearly all of us have tried to deal with what we've defined as UFDs, which are unexploded feline devices. I mean, you know, 
they come up on you real quick and anybody who's fear free will actually know that you know the cat fas they go from like zero to 60 very very quickly and they pass all of these stages but sometimes they come in with a moderately high fas already so that's fear anxiety and stress and we try and hook them out of their cat carrier and all of a sudden you know they explode in four different directions and they're armed and they make a hell of a noise they upset everything and they go for this kind of big explosive firework because they know that you know everyone's going to stop drop and run away so we that's a lot you know we don't want that cat getting so stressed in the clinic that they end up having to feel that aggression and explosion is the only way out so this is what we don't want to see is something coming out of the carrier looking like it's come out of warp drive and is coming at you armed and dangerous so any cat that either comes into the clinic normally or needs rehab may already be stressed or in pain for whatever condition has arisen. Now, remember, a lot of cats come in just for regular health visits, but, you know, a lot of people will ditch the cat visit or the vet visit because it's a hassle to get the cat in the carrier into the vet clinic. So they usually bring them in when they're actually there's something wrong. They're either painful or they're sick. So, um, they're already ouchy, they're already stressed, and then they've been put in a cat carrier, put in the car, and then bring it into the clinic. So if any of us have to provide therapy, then the stress of transportation is, is one, is the start of your stressor. Being put in a box and then taken away from your home is very stressful. So cats tend to explode in other ways, shall we say. Um, so rather than going sort of full feline UFD, you know, their, their, their bottom and their bladder tends to get the better of them. So cats are very fastidious. So you always want to make sure that as soon as they arrive, if there's been an accident, don't make a big deal out of it and make sure you clean them up as soon as possible. Like take them into a nice quiet room. Um, you know, you have to get the cat out of the carrier anyway. So you really should just ask and just say, hey, we're going to put you in a room. We'll clean you up. And at that point, you know, you can ask the owners, if, you know, if the cat has any favorite treats, bring those with you. Um, we use a lot of the Churu uh, liquid cat treats. I mean, it's basically cat crack um, and they love it. And it's a nice way to kind of break the ice with the cat. You know, once you kind of get them out of the carrier, clean them up, you know, don't make a big deal. Put a little bit of Churu on a plate and just leave it for them and then go about your business and let them kind of go to it. You know, if you get them to associate, you know, having a churu with being petted, it makes things a lot easier. It's kind of conditioning them to not expect to be kind of descended upon as soon as they come out of the cat carrier. OK, um, we also use baby food um, for our cats as well because it's strong smelling. So some cats that are not feeling particularly hungry, um, if they've got upper respiratory issues, I've got one that has chronic upper respiratory issues and I have to heat up his food when his um, when his uh, when his snot flares um, because, you know, he cannot he can't smell anything through that congestion. So he wants to eat. But because cats like to smell their food and smell makes things very enticing, I have to heat up his food of occasion um, to make sure that he'll um, that he gets the, the sense to eat. Um, advising owners, this is obviously not the kind of cat that we want to try and get out of a box. And really, you know, we want to try and avoid this kind of cat having to come into the into the clinic. So um, just advising owners to cover the carrier um, before entering the hospital. Um, and then you can also spritz some of that feline pheromone, um, you know, over the towel or over the blanket that covers the um, that covers the cage. Hospital waiting rooms, also super stressful, pheromone sprays. We actually have a little pod of towels that we spray down and put in um, Ziploc bags. Um, and then if owners want to cover the, um, the the cat carrier, say our cat room is not is in use 
and we don't have the chance to get them straight into the cat room, which is away from kind of like most of the hospital and the barking dogs, then they can put a Feliway um, approved towel over the top because that will help decrease some of the stress. So some other ideas, um, obviously keeping wait times to a minimum, um, having separate areas for cats and dogs if possible. Um, and an up area so that cat carriers aren't placed on the ground so the cat feels less exposed. And obviously, you know, any kind of exam or rehab in particular should be in a quiet and secure area. And we try and have as few people come in as possible. You know, when we're doing rehab, we like to make sure that all the equipment is in the room when the cat goes in. And once that cat comes out of its carrier, nobody comes in that door unless it's an emergency. So, you know, we've set up a secure room. The cat can come out. I know no one's going to accidentally open the door. All the equipment that we may need is in the room already. While I'm talking to the owner, the cat is walking around the room, checking everything out. So nothing's worse than kind of being kind of semi OK with your surroundings and then have um, someone come in with a large peanut or a large piece of equipment that the cat's like, what the heck is that? And kind of, you know, gets really, really startled. Um, so always try to have everything out and ready that you may need for that cat so it's not a big scare and a, and a disruption. So obviously a happy cat is obviously a happy visit. So again, any staff members planned with any rehab should make sure that everything's ready first. Cat should be given time, like I said, to explore so that it becomes um, comfortable. Um, and then just make sure that you develop a rapport with your cat. So no threatening movements. Um, try and keep your voices low and soft. It is so easy if you've got a new cat or something that's small and cute and you want to pick it up and squeeze it so its eyes bulge and just shriek in its face and tell it's adorable. Uh, yeah, cat really doesn't want that. So even if they are super cute, you know, try and contain, try and contain the enthusiasm. So let's have a look at some therapeutic exercise. So a lot of our exercises um, will work on weight shifting, weight bearing, and obviously proprioception. So proprioception is obviously knowing where your feet are in relation to the space around you. And cats have absolutely excellent um, proprioception. So we use our physio rolls to improve, improve joint flexion um, if the feet are up on the ball. And that can include sitting on the ball like a little sphinx, rocking from side to side for core balance. Um, proprioceptive input can be encouraged if we do a little gentle bouncing. I'm not talking about throwing the cat up and down on a trampoline or anything like that. Um, but get creative, but watch for signs of fatigue. Um, there are lots of different sizes of physio rolls. And because cats vary in size from little ones to bigger ones, roll towels can be um, super helpful and super useful. So this is a demonstration here. This is one of my um, cases that I saw ages ago. This is Justine. Um, so you'll notice that um, this area here is all shaved um, up over here. Um, so she had a vaccine related uh, sarcoma between her shoulder blades. Um, she had had a radiation treatment um, because um, amputation was not an option because of the position of the mass. Um, the radiation went really, really well, but she started to develop this large scab and then kind of got this abscess underneath. And um, they were uh, surgical department were anesthetizing her to put in a drain and flush everything out. And she went into cardiorespiratory arrest under anesthesia. So um, they managed to revive her. She spent uh, three days intubated on a ventilator and in CCU. So when they were able to extubate her, she, um, she was blind and she couldn't stand up. So she, they sent her to rehab. And this is us working on her balance, her proprioception and her weight bearing right here. So this is a small little peanut. Um, and we were using this to obviously work on her hind limb strength. So even though she was blind, um, you know, we were able to get her to walk relatively normally. Um, you know, her owner kept her in one 
confined room um, because obviously she was blind. But she, um, before she passed away, she was able to use the litter box, feed herself and negotiate herself around her room, which is basically, you know, everything that the owner that the owner wanted. Massage and stretching. I mean, most cats actually enjoy this as long as you're not too rough. Um, I think the biggest thing before starting any exercise program is to address the analgesia. You know, taking a few days to fix and manage pain relief adequately will make a huge difference in how your feline actually responds that and the number of band-aids that you actually might need to cover up scratches. You know, I mean, a painful cat, you know, will lash out if they're really painful. So, you know, don't underestimate pain. It's a powerful barrier to obtaining your goals. So it's pointless trying to exercise a painful patient. And that doesn't matter if you're human, canine or feline. And you'll be amazed how much better your cat will feel and your feline friends um, after the pain has actually been addressed. So how do we promote exercise in the feline patient? I mean, it's, you know, it'd be nice and easy, like most human PTs, to kind of come up and say, here's a brochure on your exercises and give it to the cat and give it to the owner and be like, okay, on your way. I mean, let's face it. I mean, most cats do not like to be told or made to do anything. So you have to get really creative. It's as much an exercise in psychology as it is physical rehabilitation. Um, you have to make it a game where there's a reward. They need something. If it's something that they are going to do, they need to know that, that there's a goal in it for them or make it their idea, pique their interest. We like to use a lot of toys, um, treats within limit, limits. Obviously, you don't want to overfeed, especially if they're trying to lose weight. Um, nip. Nip goes a long way and a lot of praise. OK, um, playing with different toys, as you'll see with um, the full upcoming slides, will aid in promoting different responses. We can do weight shifting. We can work on exercises for full limb range of motion and also a high limb range of motion. And yes, they do find you eventually. So we we will coax these little chaps out and make sure that they get their exercises done. So fun things to use for exercise for range of motion, laser pointers. I mean, my two, especially the one, goes absolutely bonkers. All he hears is the little crackle because it's we have it on a key ring. And he hears that and it doesn't matter where he is, he will come running because he knows that, that, that that's what he wants to play with. Um, string and wand toys are also great. Some knit-based toys, um, but also scratching posts. So if we look at some of these exercises, so laser pointers can obviously be used on the floor and then up walls to prevent uh, to promote stretching and weight bearing. Um, so you can have them stretch up, um, reach up, reach to the side, um, do some side stretches. But this will help promote core balance, full limb strength, range of motion um, and hind limb stretching. So strings or wand toys can be used on the floor and then lifted up in the air to encourage um, spinal extension um, and weight bearing on the back end. Um, other toys can be used to encourage forelimb use, um, like with swatting or batting. Um, and scratching posts can be sprinkled with a little nip or you can place little treats on some of the um, different uh, heights on the little platforms. Um, and that will encourage forelimb and hind limb active range of motion along with weight bearing. So, you know, all of these things that we use to play with our cats and to engage and to enrich their environment can also be used, um, you know, from a rehab standpoint as well. So some others, I love this picture. This is one of my friend's cats in a paper bag, loves a paper bag. Um, so what other things can we use to help promote exercise? Um, and you can see with our little friend here, you can see how wide his eyes are and how engaged he is in this great game of like hide and seek. And then we can kind of scratch around the, you know, the sides of the bag to have him kind of, you know, move his feet to encourage his range of motion. So tissue paper, tissue paper makes a great noise. It's crinkly. If you hide a toy or a snack under the tissue and have dig it, have Kitty dig it out, you're working on some 
mental stimulation, but also some fall in range of motion as well. Paper bags are great. They promote crawling and joint flexion. To start off nice and easy, you can use um, the bag on the side, like laying down like this picture here. You can stand the bag up so that they jump into it. And you can also use, uh, utilize cardboard boxes. So cardboard boxes come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. And all of those can be used to promote active range of motion um, and foot placement and jumping in and out. So you can get really, really creative. You can make some tunnels. You get those little disc and ball toys where it looks like a little flying saucer with a little channel and a little ping pong ball that kind of rattles around inside. So Kitty has to kind of hock and thump and knock the and knock the little ball around the you know around the little track. Um, some what we call destination jumping, so some control jumping. So you know um, on a low stool or a low box. Um, if you're trying to get the cat to jump onto a low surface, if you're starting rehab and you're improving proprioception, spinal flexibility and core strength, then just some gentle jumping to encourage um, rear limb loading. You can create an obstacle course. Um, you know, if you've got a clever kitty, a lot of people have trained their cats. They click a train their cats, get them to do tricks. You know, you can use an obstacle course if your cat, you know, if you're crafty enough and your cat is willing enough. You mean know, there has to be something high reward for these guys. Um, so you know, it's not like dogs that will do it just because they want to please you. Cats want something out of this. So you know, we've got you can do some level step overs, some broom handles you know, for some cavalettis, for proprioception, flexion and extension exercises. You know, you can have them go through a little tunnel, um, you know, maybe climb over a couple of little boxes. So, you know, getting creative really helps kind of, you know, with some mental stimulation, but also some maintaining physical activity. But you just have to hope that, you know, you do it once or twice and the cat's like, yeah, I see what you're up to and I'm, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to watch things out the window instead. So just hope that your patient cooperates and break it up into little pieces. You know, they may not be able to do everything all at once, but, you know, create some little, you know, create some fun exercises. You know, the other thing that you can do is, is to take kitty's food and just pop it up on a little raised surface so that they have to kind of stretch up a little bit. And I have a cool case study coming up that will give you um, a couple of tips and tricks on how we did that. So this poor boy, <laughs> this poor chap, um, um, thank Lynn for allowing me to uh, borrow this picture. So despite the look on this cat's face, he is actually doing a really good job of core strengthening and obviously working on his back legs. Um, you know, I just like to say, even though he's using the, the balanced donut for hind limb proprioception, we were not responsible for his haircut, which is probably why he looks so mad. Um, but this cat was working on weight loss um, and also some um, fall inflection and some weight bearing in the back end because he had um, lower lumbar stenosis. So he had a lot of spinal arthritis in his back, which obviously he was not able to groom himself because he couldn't bend to clean his back end, hence the haircut. Um, and also he became a little overweight because he's not actively exercising. He put on a bit of weight. So um, he actually went on to do really, really well. He lost some weight. He was able to groom himself and we, you know, he was allowed to grow all his hair back except for his head and his socks, but he looks like he's wearing a bodysuit, bless him. Um, another cool picture, I mean, obviously low level laser is a great idea for cats, um, assuming that, you know, we need to be really careful, no open growth plates if they're little kittens, um, and obviously no malignancies. Um, this cat had a total hip replacement. This is a Norwegian forest and he got a capital physeal fracture. Um, so we did a, um, I boss did a total hip replacement and he's getting some laser after his, um, after his activity. But that cat, again, went on and did really, really well. Um, so it just goes to show you that, you know, we do a lot of surgeries for a lot of different conditions um, and total hip replacements. I've got a video coming up of some aquatic therapy in cats. Yes, it is possible. Um, I have the videos to prove it. And, um, you know, one of them was actually a micro hip replacement. Um, cats aren't that keen on textured surface. Um, this cat had a um, 
chronic IVDD and was quite ataxic. It's a little um, Burmese. Um, so these little paw pods um, are designed for kind of balance and proprioception. So the little nubbly bits will actually help keep um, the, you know, kind of remind the cat where their feet are in relation to space. And then we can work on balance. And what Lynn's actually doing is she's actually stroking the cat from the head to the toe and kind of doing a little push up, you know, because I mean, a lot of cats, as long as their backs aren't painful, kind of will do like a little push up if you kind of run your hand kind of along their back and up their tail. So she's using that as a flexion and extension exercise while using the paw pods for balance and training and proprioception. So there are not many cats that will actually do this. And I will say that um, Lynn has the patience of a saint. <laughs> Um, we did talk a wee bit about, um, obviously, pain and discomfort. Um, you know, my old cat, the little black cat that you saw at the beginning about, you know, what was this cat thinking? That was my girl, Nina. And she had feline hyperesthesia, which is basically akin to fibromyalgia in people. And every now and again, you know, her back would flare and she would pull all of the hair out of her bottom. And... There's not many drugs that are available on the market that are true pain relievers and anti-inflammatories for cats. Um, but what we do have is the wonderful ACC loop, which is targeted pulse magnetic field therapy. And it's a true anti-inflammatory device. And it is really second to none when it comes to cats. Um, I Nina was very smart, bless her heart, and I miss her every day. But she knew that if I used the Assisi loop on her, it made her back feel better. So I would leave the little, the lid of the box um, in a place that she would get it. Um, and if she needed a treatment, she would go sit on the box and tell me that she needed a treatment. I would get the loop out. She would sit with her loop around her and it would make her back feel better. And it was what it was the only thing that with some acupuncture that actually stopped her from pulling all her hair out of her bottom. Um, so, you know, with spinal arthritis, joint arthritis, any kind of discomfort, dental pain, you know, the, the ACC loop really is second to none. And I mean, you can see all of these cats sitting here quite happily. Um, the cat obviously in the top right hand corner is sitting on um, one of the mats. But all of these cats have loops on them. They're all on. You can see with the little green lights. Um, and they're all comfortable. And I've used it on um, on my guy as well. And you'll meet him in a little bit when we go on to um, the case study. But um, it's something that the owners can use at home. You know, it's kidney safe. It's liver safe. You know, uh, it's it's one of the, the best things that we can use to help make sure that we keep our little feline friends um, pain free. And um, I love to use this in the clinic with any of my cat cases. So just remember, when rehab and pain management works really well, cats fly, literally. <laughs> um, you have to think outside the box. They always say, you know, if it's if it fits, I sit. And this is my mum's old cat, Bella. My mum got a new pair of shoes and she was like, oh, cheers, lovely box. And she literally folded her. And she was a little bit of a chonk blesser. So you can kind of see that the ends, she's kind of bulging out a little bit. My mum's feet aren't that big. Um, but um, she liked to get in a box. But, you know, we look at this and, you know, she was 16 and a half, almost 17 when she passed away. And she was as fit as a flea. And, you know, she was always in things. And you look at how, you know, she's got good spinal flexion. She's got elbow flexion. She's flexed her hips, her knees, her ankles. You know, she's, she's really working on, you know, kind of working on her range of motion. Apart from the fact that you'll see in there, there's a little green thing. And that is her favorite catnip toy. And she would put that in the box and then get in the box and then roll around in the box. So, you know, sometimes they think up their own exercises as well. So let's talk about feline aquatics. Um, there's a great YouTube video here. This is this is Buddha the cat. Um, Buddha um, started rehab um, to, oh, hello, where did that go? Hold on one sec. Um, Buddha started rehab for weight loss 
um, and started walking in the treadmill. And Buddha lost an incredible amount of weight. I mean, that's a 28 pound cat and not many 28 pound cats can actually walk without having some serious issues in their joints. You know, I mean, cats really aren't meant to be 28 pounds unless they're kind of like small tigers. So we have to remember that you've got a lot of downward force. And I mean, you can see a little bit just with this video here, even though they're having to hold Buddha up, there's a little bit of lordosis in his TL spine because, you know, his abdominal girth is pulling down on his back. And can you imagine what that's doing to his shoulders and his elbows, his hips and his knees? But I mean, Buddha's rocking the treadmill. I mean, absolutely rocking the treadmill. So, you know, feline aquatics, it, it, it's not just a myth. So what we're going to do is I've been having some a little technical issue with my um, presentation. So I'm just going to bop in here and show you this video here. So this is actually one of my clients. This is um, Maple, who is a, uh, a snowshoe. She had a micro hit replacement. And this is her rocking the treadmill. So you can see here, she's all shaved up. Um, she's about nine, nine weeks post-op. Um, she's doing really well. This is the only cat that I know that walks in the treadmill and eats peanut butter on a stick. Um, so this was the uh, third or fourth session that we had. She's got a good rate. She's walking beautifully. We do have someone in the treadmill with her. We always like to make sure that our cats have company. Um, this is Maisie. Um, Maisie is rather amazing, I will say. Um, she hiked pretty much the entire state of Colorado with her family. Um, she was one of these outdoor cats that um, the owners were very, very outdoorsy. Um, and they took a summer to um, drive around all the national parks in Colorado. And they took Maisie and Maisie walked and hiked on a, on a leash and on a harness. And she jumped off of a large fallen tree and tore her cruise ship. So she had a cruise ship repair. So we got her back up and walking in the treadmill. Um, and she gained her muscle mass. She regained full range of motion. And then the owners moved to Montana. And Maisie is currently hiked about two thirds of Montana's national parks. So, you know, this cat is absolutely amazing, but it just goes to show you that, you know, you can put, you, you can actually put cats in water. So let me go back to where I was. All right, there we go. So we can use Cavalettis. Cavalettis we use a lot for flexion, extension and proprioception. This cat was recovering from an FHO. Um, so let me get this and that doesn't want to play. Okay. Let me see. Excuse me. Just one second. Yeah. All right. Let me show you this video. I'm going to come out here and just bop this around. My apologies. Um, but we can use, we can use Cavalettis as well. But you can see that, you know, after a full start, there's a nice little trot over the Cavalettis. Really good flexion and extension coming from the hip and knee right at the end. So um, we will have a quick talk about that. Come on, computer. Oh, don't you just, I should have gone into IT. It would have been a lot easier. So I think let's have a little... Um, break and I'll just introduce you to a case study. I think, you know, the best way to highlight rehab is to show you what we do with it. You know, it's fine for me to say, yes, you need to do this and do this, but we need to see it in action. So I'm going to introduce you to Dennis. Um, when I first met Dennis, his name was BTO, which was Beat the Odds, and I will explain why. Um, so here he is. He was actually a swimmer kitten. Um, he's, his face is always perpetually dirty, but it is, doesn't he look like a dentist? He looks like a dentist. He's always a menace. Um, but he really was a cute little thing. But when I first met him, he looked like that. Ew. I mean, <laughs> little, little first knees, snot ridden, dirty faced first knees with a big problem in his front end. So Dennis is a swimmer kitten. So his, um, ability to abduct his, um, 
front legs was completely shot to pieces. So when he walked around the floor, he was only about four and a half, five weeks when I first met him. And he really couldn't walk terribly well and he wasn't able to bring his legs together. So his amazing foster family brought him into rehab once they got his boogers cleared up. Um, and we started with some range of motion to start off with. Um, let's have a look. Here we go and put some links into some videos. Here he is learning how to do range of motion. So we're holding we're holding his um, we're holding his leg into um, into the correct alignment. So we're preventing him to um, preventing him from um, abducting his elbows um, and then taking his limb through range of motion. With us with a stretch on the end. Now, his right front was more affected than his left. Um, but you can see he's tolerating it pretty well for the most part. <laughs> um, so I work with a wonderful person, Becky Gregory, and she is like a kick-ass seamstress. So we decided that what we needed to do to keep his elbows and his shoulders in was to create a hobble shirt for him which he hated so this is and unfortunately because it was a spay it was a post-operative um spay shirt so it was only available in pink which really annoyed him but um we made a custom hobble shirt for him um that we could velcro on the outside and the um with two um little pads on the inside to provide a little bit more stability and anytime dennis did any of his exercises he was in his hobble shirt so this is him down here trying to look to see what we were up to and i think he's probably thinking oh god i wish i hadn't um but it really did hold his elbows in really really nicely and we were able to keep his shoulders together so that we could work on his um work on his exercises um so here he is <laughs> wearing his shirt doing his pause up working on getting him to strengthen his shoulder stabilizers and when he wasn't in his shirt um, we encouraged his foster family to sit with him so that he sat in the little loaf position because this actually kept his um, shoulders in together as well um, we got a little bit more creative with some of his exercises um, and you can see here I mean you see the look on his face I mean he is just he is so mad but we started doing just some weight shifting with him in his little hobble shirt um, which was relatively low maintenance but you can see he's he really did not like his shirt whatsoever but it worked it definitely worked um so you can see here he is getting bigger we tried to we got him out of his hobble shirt when we could to have him obviously stabilize as best as he could these are two um two tiered balance pads that you can get these on amazon they're great but we tried to do some of his exercises in a little channel so that he was working on keeping his elbows in himself um which worked pretty well and then we started to adjust some of his exercises as a result um, we started using toys as a batting exercise. Um, so his furry mees were also a favorite. So you can see that he's pushing up and kind of smacking at the mouse. Um, there we go. And then he kind of, so we'll have him go up and around, chase the mouse, circles for weight bearing, and then have him push up um to uh you know to get to get the, the the toy um and then here i think this is his little obstacle course so we started having him play in between these little channels um to keep his little elbows in ding 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 can you not eat that please So we're also trying to work on him actually pushing up as well, which kind of comes out a little bit more 
um, in his um, other pictures, but he got bigger. Um, he was able to hold himself up. Um, so yeah, um, it's time to obviously get him out of his hobble vest. So this is us doing some bigger and better exercises. So this is a way to use um, a treat um, to have him step up. And then once he steps up, then we're doing a push up. So he's going from kind of like a squat all the way up to a full stand. So um, he liked chicken baby food. So um, I wasn't beyond um, putting chicken baby food on my fingers um, to get him to uh, get him to stand up. Unfortunately, you know, some days, you know, they do get um, a bit of the better of you. So um, this was this was, you know, how you have to be, you have to be really patient, um, you know, with your, with your patients. So I've got here a little, um, I've got a little obstacle course set up for him, um, you know, getting him to try and move across some of these, step over some of these little kind of pickup sticks and over some of the texture mats for proprioception. And um, he just wasn't having any of it um, at this point. So I was trying toys and he was like, lady, I am so over you. I really, you know, pe there's people throwing mice at me to try and get him to move. The one thing that he did hate, but loved to play with, with his, was his straight jacket. So he would always play with the strings. And I was like, yes, we're getting him to do his exercises. Um, and then it would then it would all come to a grinding halt. And then he'd be like, yes, I'm going to do his cavalettis. We're going to step. And it, yeah, it all kind of goes sideways from there. So, you know, you really do have to be patient with your cases um, and kind of, you know, be patient and, you know, you will you will get there. So here he is growing up. He really is a cute little devil. Um, and I have to say that, you know, ever the sucker for a cute kitten. Um, he and I really formed a very, very strong bond. And, you know, it was time to graduate rehab. And I just I couldn't let go of him. So I adopted him um, and I took him home. And um, he's he has been the life and soul. He is a deep thinker. Um, one of the cutest little things that I've ever, when bringing my work home with me. Um, so Dennis actually just turned two um, and he lost his buddy Sarge um, about a year ago. Um, his gait is not normal. He circumvents. So we call him Captain Paddlepuss because he kind of, you know, he can't really flex and extend his shoulders. So he kind of swings them out. But that doesn't stop him being able to run and chase. And he now has, uh, we adopted another little crippled child for him, um, who is a ginger menace, even though he looks totally cute in this picture. But Rock joined the family about a year ago and he's a syndactyl. So he only has two toes, as you can see here on his left front leg. Um, so they hurtle around and um, terrorize the place. And they really are you know, the front leg broken um, cripple gang. So he really, he really grew up really, really spectacularly well. And thanks to rehab, he really was given um, a chance to kind of live and grow and, you know, be a normal cat. And, um, you know, now he has a, you know, a little ginger friend with a bad foot to kind of, you know, turtle after him as well. I will say, even though it's a dog, this rehab stuff really is hard work, but I do really thoroughly enjoy my job.